Welcome to Regeneration Life Online. Today, the Son declared that the Father is your Father. John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And it's not just that Jesus declared the Father. Jesus declared everything about the Father that we need to know. Jesus gave us all the information. And so he declared many, many things about the Father. Today, we're going to talk about how he declared that the Father is your Father and what that means. So, we discuss yet another great truth that the Son declared about the Father. Okay, not only is the Father his Father, but if you're born again, the Father is your Father. Now, here's, here's something that might get me in trouble for with some people who don't know the Scriptures, okay? The Bible talks about God being a possession. What? Yes, you possess God. You have God. God is yours. He is your God. Let's look at this. Okay. 1 John 2, 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But now look at this. He that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. You have the Father. If you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father. And notice how, again, God is shown to be a possession. Okay? You have the Father. He is a possession. He is your possession, your greatest possession. And again, 2 John 9, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Hello, somebody. <laughs> God is your possession. You possess the Lord of the universe. He is yours if you are a born-again Christian. He is your father. If you have been regenerated, he is your father. He is your God. And you have the son as well and the spirit living inside you. Now, look how many times Jesus identifies the father as your God and your father and what it means. Our Father is our God. John 20, 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now, Jesus referring to the Father as his God is not a problem. A lot of people want to bring up, Oh, well, he just said, he, he just said the Father is God. He's his God. So apparently he's not God. Jesus isn't God. Yes, he is. Hold on. Hebrews 1, 8. Also, has the Father calling the Son God. Hello, somebody. It says, I throne, O God, uh, unto the Son, he saith. Unto the Son, he saith. Who's he? The Father, God. Thy throne, O God. Uh-oh. See, no problem. The Father also calls the Son God. But the point here is, folks, the point here is that Jesus called the Father, His Father, your Father. Amen. Okay, our Father is glorified through our works. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, the works of the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 8. God says it very clearly. That's why your works can't save you because the, the only place they can come from is the old dead nature. That's why you, <laughs> only only grace by faith can save you. You you can or excuse me, faith grace through faith is what I meant to say. The old nature cannot save. The old works mean nothing. All right, the works that come from the flesh cannot be presented before God. And then we have Romans fourteen twenty three that tells us whatsoever is not a faith. A faith is sin. Ooh, pastor's got the hiccups this morning, I think. Let's, hopefully it won't happen again. Works of the new nature. That's the works of obedience. Do please him. First John 3, 22. The pastor's up there that are like, well, nothing you do can please God. 
It does the, the, the works you do please God if you are regenerated. Okay. So 1 John 3, 22, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are, uh-oh, pleasing in his sight. Hello, somebody. Okay, you, you, the works that come from your flesh, they're nasty, they're disgusting. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. But when you're born again, the inside of you, the new man is made righteous and truly holy. That's the new nature. So you've gone from a filthy righteousness which doesn't please God to a righteousness in the spirit that does please God because it's his nature and the works that come out of that new nature do please God. Now our father is perfect and desires the same from us. I'm going to explain this. Okay. So don't panic. Matthew 5 48 be therefore perfect. Even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Okay. The Greek teleo, it means at full potential or fully developed. Now, when it comes to God, his very nature is at its fullest. Now, we must grow in grace toward our full development in him. The point here, though, is that Jesus revealed that the Father is perfect. Okay? There's nothing evil in God. And by the way, that is his goal for you and I as well, that there be nothing evil in us. We're perfected in our inner man. Perfected. I had an argument with somebody. Well, you know what? We are, we are not perfect and we never will be perfect. You're absolutely right. When you consider the flesh and the spirit together, you will never be perfect. But your inner man, your true self now in Jesus Christ is perfect. You just have to deal with this flesh suit now. Okay. But here we go. The inner man is perfect. Hebrews 9, 14. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hello, somebody. Perfected forever. That means you can't lose it, by the way. If you're perfected forever, if you've been born again, let me tell you something. Those that just attach Jesus onto their old natures, you can fall away at any time. There's nothing to hold you. All the warnings are given to those people who just who just have a superficial knowledge of Jesus Christ, but they don't ever have the internal knowledge. And Jesus never knew them. Okay, those those that are perfected, they're perfected forever. What does the word forever mean? Forever, no end. The same word would same thing with never. You'll never, if you drink of the water of life, you'll never thirst again. Hello, somebody. Never. What does never mean? Well, you know, never except under this circumstance. No, never means never. Forever means forever. And what is Hebrews 12, 23? It says the spirits of just men made perfect. Hello, somebody. The outside still needs work. And we know that. Church leadership was given by God for this purpose, Ephesians 4.12, for the perfecting of the saints. Who's a saint? The saint is somebody who's been born again. For the work in the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Folks, we still need instruction. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We all still need these. Guys, folks. I have a doctorate in theology. I have a doctorate in Christian education. I still need to be instructed. I'm learning things all the time. Okay. I still need doctrine. I still need reproof sometimes. I am not perfect when it comes to my entire being. My flesh and my spirit together, I still have to deal with the flesh. I understand. I am there with you. I get it. There is nothing that sets me apart from anybody else. I also need doctrine, reproof correction, and instruction in righteousness. Just ask my wife. There are sometimes she instructs me in righteousness. Anyway, so we still need to, to be perfected when it comes to our flesh. We still need to be working on ourselves, okay? Even though we have perfection on the inside of us, it's like the new man, okay? Uh, Ephesians says, put on the new man. Put on the new man. Well, what does it mean? It means take what's inside you, what God has put inside you, and Bring it out, okay? Our Father is a rewarder, okay? Thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. But what must we do to get the reward? Our goal is, ladies and gentlemen, our Father's praise. Do you know, you, pra you praise God. Do you know God praises you? Look at this, look at this. So this, is, this is a problem with the Jewish leadership during the time of Christ. John 12, 43. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Well, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's Jesus saying that. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that God praises you. 
Hello, somebody. Okay, our Father is a rewarder. But we need to, to seek the praise of God, not the praise of men. Our, and what is he going to say to you when you come before his throne? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's praise, folks. Our Father answers prayer, Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into that closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Oh, there's the rewards again. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye need of before ye ask him. As any parent, God wants to hear from you. He won't listen though if your motives are wrong. Hello, somebody. Now this is not an injunction. I've had this discussion in churches. This is an injunction against public prayer. Some people will read these and then, all oh, those people around the flagpole, don't they know they're supposed to pray in secret? See, it, it, this isn't an injunction against public prayer. It's an injunction against a wrong heart with wrong motives. Is your motive to be seen of men or is your motive to pray to the Father? Well, they're out there being seen a man. Well, it also says, let your good, let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works or so that, that the Lord can see your good works and reward you. Now, come on now. All right. Let me go back because I just conflated what I was trying to say. Let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Is what I meant to say. See, I still get brain things. I ain't perfect either. Just my inner man. Now, again, this is, this is this is about wrong motives. This is about a wrong heart. The motive is not, oh, let's let our light shine before men with, with, with the people that Jesus is referring to. The Pharisees and the scribes would go out in their in their robes and and they would go out and and be all haughty and 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 proud and, and arrogant, and they would stand there, and they would, Oh, God, please bless us. Please, and everybody's standing around them, and this is exactly what they want, would go, Oh, look, it's Dr. Preacherman, what a great man of God. Come on now. Those Pharisees are so righteous, I wish I could be just like them. Anyway, I don't know why I did a British accent, but it works. At any rate, yeah, they didn't speak with a British accent. It was more like this. But the point is the Pharisees would pray for the very purpose that people would see them and glorify them and not glorify God. Hello, somebody. So certain, certainly public prayer is often a light to people. All right. Again, so I, I, I want to make sure we understand this. Jesus isn't talking about gathering around the flagpole, all right? He, he's not talking about public prayers over your meals or even praying with a friend who needs it in a public place. He's talking about praying for the purpose of being seen by men so that they can look at you and go, oh, what a great man of God. Or what a great woman of God. What a great person of righteousness. That's the injunction. Now, I saw a woman with tracks in her arms and she was bawling her eyes out. Okay. And she was ordering her food at a Taco Bell a couple of years ago. She desperately wanted to get out of her lifestyle. Um, I prayed with her, with people all around us. We didn't have time to go into a closet. We didn't have time to go out to her car or wherever it was going to be. She had just ordered her food. She was waiting for her food. Tears in her eyes. I approached her. I asked her, what's the matter? She had tracks up and down her arm. She was clearly somebody who was addicted to drugs, and she wanted to get out of that lifestyle. So what did I do? Do you think that I, I looked for a, pub, for, for a place that, oh, let me get so that when they called her name, she wouldn't get her food? Come on now. No, I took her aside and I prayed with her. Why? Because it's what she needed. 
I had to minister to her. She wanted desperately to get out of that lifestyle. I, I got on my phone and I tried to find a place where she could go for the night that would help her. Okay, I contacted some people that I knew to try to help her. Why? Because she needed that prayer at that time, folks. I didn't care what anybody thought. I didn't care. My goal was to take this woman to the throne room of God. Sorry. <clears throat> the point is that Christ said that it's about your motive, guys. It's about your motive. Okay. And they're not, you're not supposed to want to go out there and, and, and be a spectacle while you pray so that people can look at you and say, what a great man of God. <sighs> Moving on, our Father wants you to forgive. Uh-oh. Matthew 6, 15, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. God is a wrathful God. We can't deny that. We cannot deny that there is a hell that is in punishment for our sin, but not our sin, but sin as a human being, sin as a person, until you come to Christ, okay? He wants to show mercy, though. That's why Jesus died on the cross is because God loves you so much that he wants to show you mercy. He wants to show you mercy. I'll repeat it again. His desire is to show you mercy. He said, I, I will have mercy. And not sacrifice. Come on, somebody. All right. God wants to forgive your sin. Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what that means. If I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he was kind of being a little sarcastic with the Pharisees at this point in time because they thought they were righteous. You hear me? But they weren't, but they thought they were. So essentially, Jesus is like, oh, I'm not coming to call you. <laughs> I love somebody. God has given us a very straight path to follow to get that mercy. To get his mercy, you have to approach his way. Cain found that out. Hello, somebody. You have to go the way that, that, that is the straight and narrow path that God has given. Very many people, when you look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23 and other verses, and he says, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity, or I know you not, ye workers of iniquity. Hello, somebody, iniquity is doing things your own way. It's approaching God your own way. It's it's <laughs> it, just like Cain. Cain said, Cain, Cain wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to come to God his way. Well, God didn't accept it, and they got mad and killed his brother. You know, there are people out there that get mad. When you try to give them the right way, I I, uh, I had somebody get on my my Facebook page and talk about how I was a bullying pastor. I'm not ashamed of it. You know why I'm not ashamed of it? Because this man could not take correction. We'd had a discussion. He said something. I gave him scripture. I was being very nice. And in the end, he just, I had to rebuke him because he was sharing things that were wrong. He was sharing things that would mislead God's people. And I called him out for it. I wasn't mean to him. I wasn't bullying him. I was giving him the word of God. And you know what he did? He got mad. And he went to my page and he tried to uh, blaspheme me on my own page. Why? Because he didn't like being corrected. He didn't want to be shown the right way. We have to follow God's way. Okay. God's way is to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ. Not to just attach Jesus to your old nature and get some kind of Jesus style religion. That's the old nature. That old nature don't save you. The new nature saves you. I got so mad my southern came out. Come on now. Listen, they that are born again want to obey God, folks. And that fruit of love comes from inside us because of the new nature. Listen, if someone stabs you and you forgive that person, it don't stop the bleeding. There are people out there who think, well, you know what? I still hurt over things that have been done to me 10 years ago. Folks, I still hurt over things that a church did to me 20 years ago. But you know what? I want their best. I want to see them in heaven. I don't want to hold it against them. Does it hurt? Yeah, it does, because it wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Okay, I still hurt over, over that church when I went into their Bible study, and I believe once saved, always saved, folks. 
Of course, I also have to believe that you are saved before that happens. I don't go for all of this repeat after me. And uh, that's not that's not the sinner's prayer. OK, the sinner's prayer comes from a, from a newborn nature that cries out to its God. It isn't repeat after me. That's a work. OK, but I do believe in eternal security. But they brought up this point and it was it was and, and it bothers me when churches do this. And they'll say things like, um, well, you know, uh, if you kill someone, you're still saved. You'll go to prison, but you'll you'll take your salvation with you. <laughs> and I asked them, I said, well, what do you do with the verse that says no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him? And folks, that caused no small stir. You know what the you know what it means? Here's what it means. If you commit murder, you ain't born again. That's what it means. If you commit murder, you're not born again. Now that doesn't mean that you you, you, you oh I accidentally killed somebody when I was defending my family, or even somebody breaks through your door, you're not going out to kill them. You're defending your family. That's different. That's very different. We're talking about they were they were talking about well you can actually just go out and kill someone ha <laughs> ha commit murder ha 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 you'll just take your salvation to prison with you come on now but you know what here's the thing I forgive the people they did it in ignorance they didn't know they they hadn't been led correctly and a pastor if you're listening to me I'm talking to you that pastor from that from that church a little old Baptist church I'm a I'm a Baptist. For all intents and purposes, we we we're we're registered as Baptist Church. Let me tell you something, folks. Let me tell you something. That was wrong. That kind of stuff was wrong, and the very fact that there was a nuclear explosion in that room was wrong. The very fact that they came after me for for saying that was wrong. Okay, and then it, I get the sarcastic comment. Well, you know, I guess David wasn't saved. That was wrong. But I don't hold it against them. Okay, I'm not going to sit there and 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 oh, I want bad things to happen to those people. No, I want good for them. I want them to go to heaven. I want them to learn. I want them to find the ways of righteousness that God has taught in His Word. I want the best for these people. I don't want anything bad for them. I have forgiven that sin against me. All right. I've, I've had, does it hurt? Yes. Again, you know, somebody shoots you in the shoulder. Forgiveness doesn't remove the bullet. And it doesn't stop the bleeding. And it doesn't stop the hurting. So if you hurt over something that, that somebody did to you, it doesn't mean you haven't forgiven them. The, the test of whether or not you've forgiven them is do you want them to pay for what they did? And if you do not want them to pay for what they did, if you are willing to say, Father, forgive them, and, and you forgive them too, and you let it go, you don't treat them any differently. Does it still hurt? Yeah, it still hurts. But it doesn't mean you haven't forgiven. You need to forgive them. You need to want the best for these people, okay? What forgiveness is, is the release of a debt. Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then Luke eleven four, 4, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Forgiveness is the release of a legitimate debt that someone owes you because of what they did to you. Okay? It's not sweeping sin under the rug. It is not, it is not a, a, a oh, you just got to forgive them. Oh. No, it's not that either. Okay, it's not pretending it never happened. There are a lot of people who think, well, I need to pretend it never happened. And, and I'm telling you what, the whole thing about forgive and forget, you're not going to forget. And that's that's putting a bad burden on people. The Bible never tells you to forget. Now, God forgets, but that's not you. You're still walking around. you got this, this thing inside your head. God wills to forget it. All right, there are some things you can't forget. There are some things you shouldn't forget. If somebody stabs you in the back, all right, and, and, and you almost die, you'd be a fool to turn your back on them again. And they're holding a knife in their hand. No, 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 use some, exercise some discernment. No, nobody can kill God, but you can get killed. And not only that, but what about these people that have been molested their entire lives? Are they supposed to, oh, you need to forget that. That, well, if you've truly forgiven, you need to forget. That's ridiculous. 
that is that, that puts an that, that puts an undue burden on people. No, no. Forgiveness is merely releasing the person from a legitimate debt. I've known people that have been molested as children. I have known people that had somebody come into their house and kill their parents. Okay? I have known people that have had these things happen to them. Okay? They have forgiven the people that did it. They forgave them. They released that debt and they want nothing but the best for these people. They want them born again. They pray for them. Pray for them who that despise and persecute you. Come on now. All right. Essentially, forgiveness, okay, is tackling the sin head on and saying that hurt me, but I love you more than the pain that you caused me. My love for you is greater than the hurt that you have brought into my life. So I am not going to hold it against you because my love is greater. Okay. Luke 6, 36 and 37 says, Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Forgive and ye shall be forgiven. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, When ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Aught means anything. If any of you have anything against anybody, forgive them. Let it go. It doesn't mean that you have to turn around and be and, and like uh, em embrace them into your life full force again. All right. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. How do I put this? Uh, forgiveness itself, because you're human. Now, with God, it's different. He's God. But forgiveness between us doesn't necessarily mean that I want to go hang out with you on, on, a, on a Saturday anymore. I don't have to. I want your best. I want everything good for you. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I that, that it's that it's beneficial for me to hang around you. Okay? It doesn't mean I haven't forgiven. Moving on. Our Father desires us to be different and to love. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Uh-oh. <laughs> By the way, um, so this applies to some marriages. <laughs> love your enemies. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Oh, there's a Bible says to love your wife. Oh, but she's so distant. Okay, Bible says to love your neighbor. Oh, but she's so mean. Bible says to love your enemies. Come on now. Come on now. All right, anyway. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. That's about all. <laughs> How do I explain that? How do I, how do I add to that? Love your enemies. Pour yourself out into your enemies. Uh, bless them if they if they say bad things to you. Bless them back. Do good to them that hate you. All right. Anyway, our Father is a gift giver. Matthew seven eleven. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Now this is one of those verses of the name it claim it people take it and twist it and. And take it out of context and use it for something that it doesn't mean. Because James 1.17, we need to let scripture interpret scripture. James 1.17, every good and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's true. But then we move on to James 4.3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Okay. So these verses aren't verses saying you can name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, confess it, possess it. They're not prosperity verses. Okay? Listen, our God is a provider. It doesn't necessarily mean he's going to give you everything that you want. Now he, he's put stuff on this earth for us to enjoy. But some things that these people want, all right, let me put it this way. Uh, God is not, if you, if you pray, I, I, Lord, I want you to give me a poisonous snake. Seriously? You think God's going to put in your hand a poisonous snake? Some people are better off poor. And I'm serious when I say that. There are some people that if God gave them riches right now, they'd walk away from God in a heartbeat because they would put their trust in riches instead of God. They would focus on their riches instead of God. There are people right there who, who have made professions of faith right now that I know of. They're friends of friends that have made professions of faith and they their money do, do they put it into the ministry? No, they don't put it in the ministry. You know where they put it? They put it into trips to Europe and 
and and and uh, fashion shows, and I can go on with what they do with their money. They don't glorify God with it, but God will give the people riches that will glorify God with it. But most of you don't be thinking, oh, well, I can just name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, confess it, and possess it because Kenneth Copeland told me so. I don't think so, son. The Bible says no. The Bible says ye ask and receive not because ye ask and miss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. All right. Now, again, James 1.17 says every good and every perfect gift is from above that cometh down from the father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But we don't change either. Our father, again, is a provider. Luke 12, 28 through 30. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not. Seek not ye what ye, ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. God's not going to let you go hungry. Folks, I have been on the precipice of homelessness. I have been two days from being homeless and saw God work a miracle immediately. Boom, there it was. Amen. And I never went homeless. I have had a situation where I didn't get paid till the next day and there was almost no food in the house. And boom, suddenly there was food in the house. Knock on the door. Hey, is there anything you need? Uh, yeah, I, I need <laughs> the dog thought someone's at the door. Anyway, yeah, either that or she's saying amen, brother. I had somebody knock at the door and provide food. Okay, and, and I had a good meal that night, and then I was able the next day to go get some food. That was years ago. Um, our Father speaks through us, Matthew 10, 20. For it is not ye that speak. That was me. That was me. <laughs> For it is not ye that speak, but the, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Okay? The Lord did not send the false and does not speak through them. Ezekiel 13, 6, they have, not, they, they have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. Uh-oh, hello, somebody. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. The Lord didn't send them, okay? Jeremiah 23, 25 through 28 says, I have heard what the prophet said, the prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. In other words, God told me, uh-oh. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor. As their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word. Faithfully, what is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Who's the chaff? The people saying God told me, well, they're they're talking about the same God, aren't they? Uh, many of these people have created a God in their heart that they call Jehovah. They've created a God in their heart that they call Jesus. It's not the true God because they've created it in their own image in their heart. They have created a Jesus idol, in other words. Oh, brother, you're, you're walking on some thin ice now. No, I'm going to stomp that ice. I don't care. They have created an idol in their heart, just like the Israelites when they created the golden calf. They called it two of the holy names of God. There are a lot of people who create an idol in their heart and they call it Jesus. And it's not the true Jesus. OK, it's not the authentic Jesus. And so a lot of these people, when they say, God told me, yeah, no, no, God didn't say anything to you. All right. The, the word is here is clear. OK, he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Okay, the one that has a dream, let him tell his dream. Anyway, but those who are of God, those who are of God, those who have been born again, those who have the regenerated nature. He that heareth you, Jesus said this, he that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. In other words, the Father, God. Those who are of him, 
and speak his word, <laughs> those that are of God's word will hear them. Now, let's talk about becoming a child of God. All right, we talked about our father. We need to talk about how you become a child of the living God. Okay, John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That means not everybody's a son of God. Not everybody's a child of God. Okay? Even to them that believe on his name. Okay? They that received Jesus were given power to become sons of God. Okay? Some people are children of the devil. I'm sorry. Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world. The good seed of the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. 1 John 3.10, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay, those, those are called here children of the devil. And there are many who will appear righteous, and they will appear religious, but they've never been born again. They're still children of the devil. Luke 8.44, and these are people that came to Jesus, okay, they came to Jesus and they supposedly believed. Okay, but here's what Jesus says to them. Ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Okay, again, these people were supposedly believers. Yet they argued with him, they denied his deity, they denied his virgin birth, and they ever sought to kill him. And yet they believed. It was only up here, folks. It wasn't in here. They didn't believe under righteousness. They just, well, he might be the Messiah. Well, he, you know what? I, 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 I think I could accept him as the Messiah. And then Jesus starts teaching, and they're like, oh, no, I can't. We've never, <laughs> and it just went on from there. And then in the end, they, they ended up wanting to stone him because they couldn't tolerate his doctrine. If you're truly born again, if you truly believe, you not only tolerate doctrine, you love true doctrine. Even some ministers, folks, are still children of the devil. I'm sorry. Second Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. They're, and I'm sorry, they're, they're on Christian television at large. There are a lot of, of people that are twisting and perverting God's doctrine to, to get money. Let's read this. Let's read this couple of verses. No marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Listen, you can only become a child of God through two, true faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.26. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You want to take that scripture out of context? I've seen people do it. You're all the children of God. That's what the word says. No, it doesn't. It says you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of people in our churches who, who don't have true faith and who've never been born again. They got religion. They didn't get true faith. Okay. They didn't, their heart didn't believe under righteousness. Okay. They made a confession, but not from a heart that believed under righteousness. Well, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, that's true. I love that verse. I think that verse is amazing. But what do you need before you call upon the name of the Lord? Go back a couple of verses. A heart that believes under righteousness. If you don't have a heart that believes under righteousness, Jesus is like, well, how can you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? A heart that believes under righteousness wants to follow its God. A heart that believes under righteousness has become a sheep. Okay, his sheep hear his voice. He knows them and the sheep follow him. Come on now. Come on now. So the people that are children of God are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When you have faith in Christ, your entire being is changed. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 shows that grace resurrects your spirit, your inner man. It was dead in transgressions and sins is now resurrected. You have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, you're saved. That shows you grace is what does it. If you haven't been, been born again, you have not received grace. 
That's going to get me in trouble in some places, but it's true. Take a look at, at verse 5. Okay, it says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, means made us alive, together with Christ. And then it says, by grace, ye are saved. It's by grace that you are regenerated. It's by grace that you receive a new nature. Grace changes your old nature, folks. Okay, grace, grace resurrects your spirit, and inside you, he places a new nature. Well, let's look at the old nature. Notice the past tense. Okay, look at the past. Make sure you... Be very clear and keep in mind the past tense here. Ephesians 2, 2 through 3, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Okay, so, so the people that are still children of disobedience, the, that spirit of the devil is still working them. Among whom also we all had... Our conversation, that means behavior. In times past, that's the conversation is is uh, uh, in early modern English. It didn't just mean speaking; it also meant behavior. Any anything you did that would communicate something to someone else, which is essentially everything you do if someone else is around. Uh, we had our behavior conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were. By nature, the children of wrath, even as others. See, you, you, you have been changed. Grace changes your old nature into something else. Grace saves you, again, through faith, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace makes you a new creation that now works for God, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, see, it says should, brother. Yeah, well, should doesn't mean what you think. Should has changed meanings, okay? Uh, God ordained you to walk in the new works of the new creation. If God ordained it, it's not a should the way you think of should. It's a should as in you're going to do it. Okay, It's more of a certainty than it is a, 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 good, a good choice. Let's put it that way. A good option. We have been brought close to God, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You're made near. You're made close. Okay? We are made one with the Spirit. When you're born again, you are made one with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he is our peace, referring to Christ, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Who's us? You and God. Me and God. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That means extreme violence and hatred. Even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself twain to one new man. So making peace that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. Again, that's extreme violence and hatred. And it's been slain by the cross. OK, Jesus made you one with the Holy Ghost. Jesus made you one with the Holy Spirit and presented you back to God the Father. This is how you have peace with God. Okay? You now have access to God, Ephesians 2.18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The born again, regenerated, spiritual resurrection experience has made you one with God. Now you just have to deal with the flesh. <laughs> now we are begotten, born of the spirit first peter 1 3 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead because he was resurrected from the dead you now have the resurrection from the dead in your spirit and you will be resurrected from the dead in your physical being later we're also adopted okay you're adopted who was your father before the devil Hello, somebody. 
We were adopted from the devil's family, who was our father, to now God's family, and God is our father, okay? All right, Galatians 4, 4 through 5. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Do you want to receive the adoption of a child? Do you want to leave your old family? Do you want to walk away from what you were? Do you want to become go go from being somebody who can't please God to somebody whose very existence is pleasing to God? Do you want to walk into the love of the Father? Do you want to become a child of the living God? You can do that through faith in Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. Tell him you're a sinner. Tell him you know you deserve his wrath. Tell God that you know that Jesus died on the cross for you. Cry out to the Father. If you come to him, he will not turn you away. If your heart is a good heart that is believing that because you have now believed under righteousness, okay? Luke 8, 15 says that that's a good heart. It's the only time the heart's ever pictured as good in the word is when it believes under righteousness. You can have the father today. You can change your family today. You can make sure that your spirit goes to be with him today. You just need to be born again, folks. And that's something that God does inside you when you have faith in Jesus Christ. Call out to him. Pour your heart out to him. He will listen. If your heart now believes under righteousness that you can now confess unto salvation, call out to God. That, that scripture, Romans 8, 13, is true. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's go ahead and bow our hearts to our wonderful Father in heaven. Thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, for this day, Lord. Thank you for this message, God. I pray that whoever hears it, Father God, will come to know you as their Father, because you are not just the Father, God. You are our Father, the Father of those who are born again, Father God. And I pray, Father God, that you help people escape escape the, 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 the chains of the devil, and they can be set free in Jesus Christ. I thank you for all of it in his holy name. Amen.